Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 244 and 245, which read as follows. Sutji wanga hirikena kakasurena dangsina pakandina pagabhena sankili tena jivitang hirimata chadu jivang nichang suchi gavesina ali nena pagabhena sundha jivena pasata which means easy is the life of one who is shameless brazen like a crow impudent bold reckless living a corrupted life And hard is the life of the conscientious, ever pure in their search, vigilant, dedicated, not boastful or bold or impudent or brazen, living a pure life with vision. So this set of verses was taught in regards to a, a very short story, the occasion of a certain monk who traded medical services for food. And so he had been a doctor perhaps before he became a monk, and once he became a monk, he realized that by continuing to offer medical services, he could... He could amass, uh, or he could acquire luxurious uh, requisites. So he would spend his time tending to lay, rich lay people and in return getting the choicest of foods and, and robes and medicines and so on. And one day when he was coming back from getting food, he saw Sariputta, the Buddha's chief disciple, uh, accompanied by a group of monks, I guess. And he saw Sariputta and he said, Venerable Sir, please, I've received all this food. Come partake in it. And he, he explained to him, he said, I I offer my medical services to the people and, and it's such a great idea because they give me all this good food. And Sariputta looked at him, listened to what he had to say, and turned around and walked away. Now the monks, hearing this, went to go, went to see the Buddha and told this to the Buddha. And the Buddha simply said, "Indeed, that monk is living an easy life. His corrupt ways providing him with a pure life, and it's hard, hard to be someone who is pure. Their life will be hard." And then he taught these verses. It's a deceptively profound teaching and I think hard to understand if you if you investigate it. It's a hard one to appreciate and to really get behind because it appears to be saying that what we're doing, all of what we're doing is the wrong path. We are purposefully making life harder for ourselves. That's what it sounds like. Because the options, uh, being corrupt, or at the very least, seeking out pleasure, seeking out the sources of pleasure, that's the right way. It leads to, well, pleasure. It seems to go very much against the law of karma, which we understand to mean that being a pure of a pure mind or, or having a pure uh, character Living an ethical life would lead to good things. Why does the Buddha appear to be saying the opposite? That it's corruption that leads to good things. An easy life. Well, we know this to be true. If you look, in, if you look at the world, this is the case. It, 
it's a very simple fact that all other things being equal, uh, chasing after the pleasure that is available is going to lead to more pleasure than not chasing after the pleasure, most obviously. There's no question here. When you have a set of potentials in front of you, seizing the potential, seize the day, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. Do it, because the opportunity is there. Taking that opportunity makes life more pleasurable, generally makes life easier. We have to appreciate this, we have to understand this, because it's the essence of how we think of happiness. We see this, this is an obvious truth And so our thinking of how to attain and obtain happiness is always along these lines It's the way, of, the way in, in conventional world and it's the way even in meditation This bleeds over into our meditation practice Where it's often quite discouraging when your practice on a Buddhist uh, path is unpleasant, is hard and it, it, it seems to be moving away from pleasure on, on, in many ways. The Buddha even acknowledged this and, and reminded us to acknowledge the, the gratification of sensuality, that there is the gratification and it is there. But it doesn't take much to see the potential danger. Now with uh, the, the example of this monk, of course, we're talking about sort of the very purest sort of livelihood. It doesn't seem dangerous for someone to exchange uh, medical services for, for food, for example. I mean, no matter how luxurious it is. But it just speaks to how high a standard monks are held to. Becoming a monk is a complete acceptance of, or we say a complete rejection of this whole system of pleasure seeking. But we can see this happening in the world and it's, it's much more easy to see if we talk about it on a gross level. We see how the addiction to drugs, for example, certainly uh, engages this on a very extreme level, this idea that the opportunity for pleasure exists, therefore seeking it is the way to, of course, find pleasure, but, but uh, implicitly to find happiness. Because we equate pleasure with, with this word, happiness, we equate them. We think of them, well, pleasure means happiness, happiness means pleasure, they are one and the same. And yet a person who engages in drugs, for example, ends up being more unhappy, obviously. Their life becomes more unhappy. It involves the... the it's, it's because there's what you might consider a, a catch-22, to invoke that uh, literary uh, uh, title, that in order to experience pleasure, you have to chase after it. But a person who chases after pleasure, or the act of chasing after pleasure, reduces reduces the amount of pleasure that you gain, reduces the potentiality to obtain pleasure. If you think about a drug addict, it, it, uh, it reduces the brain's capacity to gain pleasure from the same, same experiences. But if you think of it in a, in a worldly sense, uh, an external sense as well, a drug addict loses respect, they lose friends, uh, they, they get in trouble with the law but through stealing because the means of obtaining become more and more extreme. As, as you follow this to its logical conclusion, if seeking pleasure is always the right answer, then, you, then, then the consequences or the, so the means of obtaining it uh, become inconsequential, the, the, the details of how you obtain it, you ignore them, you 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 go beyond uh, what is appropriate. So for a monk, of course, what is appropriate is very little, and we're we're uh, we dedicate ourselves to 
and no pursuit of sensual pleasure. But for, for a lay person, we can see it in things like drug, ad drug addiction. We can also see it in, in, in business. We see it in the stock market. I mention the stock market because, uh, uh, coincidentally, there's a very big story in the news uh, that I noticed and, and started reading about. Apparently, there, there's this, in the stock market, a little bit of a tangent, but very much related. They 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 take money uh, and say, "I'll owe you a certain number of stocks." They say stocks are worth ten dollars. Give me a hundred, and I'll owe you ten stocks. And they do this. So they take the money, but they do it with stocks that are going down in value. So as the value goes down. They can give them. The, they can buy the stocks and give them back, and they made money on it because they bought. They buy later when it's lower. They're betting on the fact that it's going to go lower. So apparently, the entire stock market or the rich people uh, bought a hundred and uh, borrowed a hundred and forty percent of the stocks of this company, which there is only a hundred percent. Means they they bought too many. They borrowed too many. Uh, another group of amateur investors found out about this. And now the whole stock market's in a in a in a tizzy because they can't pay it back, and mil billionaires are losing millions of dollars, and uh, amateur investors are making millions of dollars, and so on. I bring it up because it, just reading about it and, and wa looking at this, it this is the the epitome of this this seeking out of uh, gain and the greed involved. And ultimately, how it 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 leads to an, it leads in the stock stock market especially to an increase an increase in uh, of greed until you manipulate the stock market and and do engage in illegal practices and so on, and you can lose your entire wealth and and income, and there's no end to it. So. The whole system of pleasure seeking is caught up in in a, a catch twenty two. That the more you seek out, the more trouble you get into. When you stop seeking out, of course, you don't get the pleasure. And so, on a fundamental level, pleasure cannot be equated with happiness. It can't make you happy because you have two choices, and neither one works. You you seek out the pleasure, and you need more pleasure. You stop seeking out the pleasure and you don't get any pleasure. It has a system, it just doesn't work. So when we talk about in this verse the idea of, of living an easier life, we're really talking about on the short term. And we're talking about on the external level. A person who engages in betting on the stock market, engages in... Um, drug addiction, even a monk who engages in medical practices obsessed with the idea that they're going to gain food is is inevitably going to come to greater suffering. Their life becomes easier as a result, but their mind becomes corrupt. And so when we under when we think of the law of karma, we have to understand it. Uh, on, on a mental level first Karma works on, a, on its very base On a mental level We can't look at what happens in the external world Because of course it's far too complicated And because it involves past consequences Being born as a human being We have so much potential For obtaining pleasure And our corruption that The corruption that comes from seeking the pleasure Isn't going to catch up with us not 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 quickly, because we're protected by all the many factors that are set, the physical factors. But the mental factors are immediate. A person who engages in the acquisition of sensual pleasure is immediately caught up in this web of craving, increased desire. This is where meditation comes in, and this is what you see much more clearly on the on the, the meditative level, the experiential level. 
It's very difficult to see karma working in the world around us when we see rich people engaging in these uh, manipulative practices or even drug addicts. If you look at them externally, it's hard to see what's really happening, where, where the danger is. For this monk, it's hard to see what the danger is. He appeared to be living quite well, and the Buddha remarked on it. But the danger is, is very real and very fundamental, much more fundamental than the externalities, because we have rich billionaires now quite upset because they're losing money, and, and they're certainly not uh, going to be living on the streets as a result of this upheaval, but they're certainly upset about it. Every And the people who are angry at them are upset for, for breaking the law and so on. You can be surrounded by great pleasure, and in fact, the more pleasure you surround you, yourself with, the more unhappy you become, the more dissatisfied you become, because the, the act of acquiring the pleasure increases your desire for it. It's, it's a habit. Everything uh, in the mind works in, in terms of habits. Whatever you cultivate, whatever you engage in, becomes your habit. Desiring something, going after it, increases the imp impulse to go after it. So it doesn't lead to contentment. It's not, if I get this, I'll be content. Because you're engaging this impulse to, to, to obtain. And that increases the habit of needing to obtain. It, it's impossible to satisfy. So when the Buddha said that a person who lives corrupt, lives an easy life. He was only talking about the externality. He was pointing out what we have to understand uh, about, about Buddhism and about meditation practice specifically. That it's not going to bring us more pleasure. It's not going to make life easier. In many, many cases, most cases we might say, it's going to make life harder. That's not intentional, and that's certainly not across the board, and it's certainly not a long-term problem. Because, of course, when you engage in purity, people respect you more, uh, your mind becomes more focused, many good things start to come to you. But no matter how many good things come to you, 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 you refrain from seeking them out. You refrain from indulging your desire for them. We have to understand this. This will always be the case, and it's 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 intentionally the case because our intention is to move in another direction. Our happiness, our search for happiness, is in another direction. Our happiness is outside of externalities. Our happiness is independent of our experiences. That's the goal. So when we practice meditation, this is where I think it, it hits home most most viscerally and, and, and really most importantly for us. Meditation can be, and quite often is, and perhaps you could say should be, difficult. Meditation is for the purpose of overcoming craving, freeing ourselves from craving. So if you're free from craving, you don't have to practice meditation, but... Insofar as we have craving, it's going to be difficult because it's going to challenge us. It's going to uh, change our attitude. It's going, going to change our interaction with those things that we crave. It's going to help us or force us to see them objectively. It's not so much about denying yourself pleasure. It doesn't work in the conventional sense of uh, abstaining. No. Mindfulness doesn't work that way. It works in the way of seeing objectively. So a thing that you might desire or crave after, rather than saying, no, no, I'm, I refuse, you, you find the mid, what you can see as the middle way, absolutely. The middle way of seeing that object as it is, not... Oh, this is nice, I want this. But also not, this is dangerous, I must stay away. This is, is this. 
it avoids the pitfalls of both uh, courses of action. If you are, of course, as we said, chasing after it, this is good. You cultivate that, but but by avoiding it, you don't gain any special knowledge about pleasure and desire. You 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 create instead an impulse of aversion, and you can see this. You'll start to become bitter and unhappy. In in the beginning, for many monks and meditators, it can be quite an unhappy life because you 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 find yourself doing that. You remind yourself that oh, this way is not right. And this is what the Buddha found him doing for, himself doing for six years Repressing uh, Repressing the desires, pushing away the desire Rejecting it Until he found this, what he called the middle way And he saw, pleasure isn't the problem Pleasure is just pleasure The problem is that I want the pleasure The problem is just, is, is, the, is that There's a distinction there I don't have to reject pleasure, he said I just have to see it clearly and free myself from the desire for it. So what we see quite often with new meditators is they become discouraged. They become discouraged because the results are not as they would expect. What we expect uh, uh, Ordinarily from meditation Is pleasure Because that's how we understand happiness Oh, I'm unhappy Meditation will make me happy Therefore it must bring me pleasure And it doesn't Mindfulness meditation doesn't And there are many experiences in meditation That can bring that pleasure Many types of meditation That can bring pleasure And so we seek out those and we become discouraged when practicing mindfulness because it doesn't seem to be doing that. It doesn't seem to be bringing us, bringing us happiness at all, not in the beginning. Until we make that paradigm shift, until we come to see beyond pleasure, seeing pleasure for pleasure, pain for pain, experience just as experience, then you start to understand what true happiness is. True happiness is inextricable from freedom, from independence. It requires that you free yourself from need, from desire, from addiction, from aversion. It requires objectivity and clarity. And so the last word of these two verses that the Buddha used is perhaps the most important, pasata. It seems somewhat unconnected to the rest. It, it's not an equivalent of See, the verses are, are parallels One talking about being corrupt The other talking about being pure But then he adds the last word, pasata Pasata means seeing Or one who sees Because that's ultimately what purity means It doesn't mean rejecting pleasure It means seeing pleasure and pain equally And, and clearly as they are So that's what we try to do in meditation And I think, as you can hopefully see it's a very important teaching, an important verse, something that challenges us and helps us to see the depth of the teaching as not just a better way to find pleasure, but a, a different way to understand pleasure and a better way to understand happiness. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you for listening. I wish you all peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. Thank you. <laughs>